do. Uh, let's see. So, chapter three, we had Harry getting into a discussion with Uncle Vernon over trying to get to the Quidditch World Cup after his invitation to go there. Uncle Vernon said yes. Um, and now we are going into chapter four, which is back to the burrow. By 12 o'clock next day, Harry's trunk was packed with his school things on all of his most prized possessions. The invisibility cloak he had inherited from his father, the broomstick he had got from Sirius, the enchanted map of Hogwarts he had been given by Fred and George Weasley last year. He had emptied his hiding place under the loose floorboards of all food, double-checked every nook and cranny of his bedroom for forgotten spellbooks or quills, and taken down the chart on the wall counting the days down to September the 1st, on which he'd like to cross off the days remaining until he returns to Hogwarts. The atmosphere inside number four Privet Drive was extremely tense. The imminent arrival at their house of the assortment of wizards which were making the Dursleys uptight and irritable. Uncle Vernon had looked downright alarmed when Harry informed him that the Weasleys would be arriving five o'clock the very next day. I hope you told them to dress properly, these people, he snarled at once. I've seen the sort of stuff your lot lot wear. You better have the decency to put on normal clothes, and that's all. Harry felt a slight sense of foreboding. He had rarely seen Mr. or Mrs. Weasley wearing anything that the Dursleys would call normal. Their children might don muggle clothing during the holidays, but Mr. and Mrs. Weasley usually wore long robes in varying states of shabbiness. Harry wasn't bothered about what the neighbours would think, but he was anxious about how rude the Dursleys might be to the Weasleys if they had turned up looking like their worst ideas of wizards. Uncle Vernon had put on his best suit. To some people, this might have looked like a gesture of welcome, but Harry knew it was because Uncle Vernon wanted to look impressive and imitating somehow. Dudley, on the other hand, looked somewhat diminished. This was not because the diet was at last taking effect, but due to fright. Dudley had emerged from his last encounter with a fully grown wizard with a curly pig's tail poking out of the seat of his trousers. An Arpetunia and Uncle Vernon had to pay for its removal in a private hospital in, in London. It wasn't altogether surprising, therefore, that Dudley kept running his hand nervously over his backside and walking sideways from room to room so as not to present the same target to the enemy. Lunch was almost a silent meal. Dudley didn't even protest at the food. Cottage cheese and grated celery. Aunt Petunia wasn't eating anything at all. Her arms were folded. Her lips were pursed and she seemed to be chewing her tongue as though biting back the furious di diorate she longed to throw at Harry. They'll be driving, of course. Uncle Vernon barked across the table. Eh, said Harry. He hadn't thought of that. How were the Weasleys going to pick him up? They didn't have a car anymore. The old Ford Anglia that had once owed was currently running wild in the forbidden forests of Hogwarts. But Mr. Weasley had borrowed a Ministry of Magic car last year. Possibly it would do the same today. I think so, said Harry. Uncle Vernon snorted into his moustache. Normally, Uncle Vernon would have asked for what car Mr. Weasley drove. He tended to judge other men on how big and expensive their cars were. But Harry doubted whether Uncle Vernon would have taken to Mr. Weasley even if he drove a Ferrari. Harry spent most of the afternoon in his bedroom. He couldn't stand watching Aunt Petunia peer out through the net curtains every second, as though there had been a warning about an escaped rhinoceros. And finally, at quarter past five, Harry went downstairs and into the living room. Aunt Petunia was compulsively straightening cushions. Uncle Vernon was pretending to read the paper, but his tiny eyes were not moving, and Harry was sure he was really listening with all of his might for the sound of an approaching car. Dudley was crammed into an armchair, his porky hands behind him. Clamped firmly around his bottom, Harry couldn't take the tension. He left the room and went and sat on the stairs in the hall, his eyes on his watch and his heart pumping fast from excitement and nerves. But five o'clock came and then went. Uncle Vernon, slightly in his suit, opened the front door, peered up and down the street, then withdrew his head quickly. They're late, he snarled at Harry. I know, said Harry, maybe uh, the traffic's bad or something. Ten past five and then quarter past five. Harry was starting to feel anxious himself now. At half past, he heard Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia conversing in terse mutters in the living room. No consideration at all. We might have had an engagement. Maybe they think they've all got invited to dinner if they were late. Well, they most certainly won't be, said Uncle Vernon. And Harry heard him stand up and start pacing the living rooms. They'll take that boy and go. There'll be no hanging around. That's if they're coming at all. Probably mistake the day, I dare say. Their kind don't set much store by punctuality. Either that or they drive some tin pot car that's broken. Ah! Harry jumped up, 
From the other side of the living room door came the sounds of the three Dursleys scrambling, panic-stricken across the room. Next moment, Dudley came flying into the hall, looking terrified. What happened? said Harry. What's, what's the matter? But Dudley didn't seem to be able to speak. Hands still clamped over his buttocks, he waddled as fast as he could into the kitchen. Harry hurried into the living room. Loud bangings and scrapings were coming from behind the Dursleys' boarded-up fireplace, which had a fake coal fire plunged into the front of it. What is it? gasped Aunt Petunia, who had backed into the wall and was staring terrified towards the fire. What is it, Vernon? But they were left in doubt barely a second longer. Voices could be heard from inside the block fireplace. Ugh! Fred, no, go back, go back. There's, there's some kind of mistake. Tell George not to. Ah! George, no, that there's no room. Go back quickly and tell Ron. Maybe Harry can hear us, Dad. Maybe he'll be able to let us out. There was a loud hammering of fists on the boards behind the electric fire. Harry, ha Harry, can you hear us? The Dursleys rounded on Harry like a pair of angry wolverines. What is this? growled Uncle Vernon. What's going on? They, uh, they, they've tried to get here by flu powder, said Harry. Fighting a mad desire to laugh, they, they can travel by fire. Only you've blocked the fireplace. Hang on. He approached the fireplace and called through the boards. Mr Weasley, can you hear me? The hammering stopped. Somebody inside the chimney piece said, shh. Mr Weasley, it's Harry. The fireplace had been blocked up. You won't be able to get through. Damn, said Mr Weasley's voice. What on earth did they want to block up the fireplace for? They've got an electric fire, Harry explained. Really? said Mr Weasley's voice excitedly. Electric, you say, with, with a plug. Gracious, I must see that. Let's see. Out, Ron! Ron's voice now joined the others. What are we doing here? Has something gone wrong? Oh no, Ron, came Fred's voice very sarcastically. No, no, this is exactly what we wanted to end up in. Yeah, we're having the time of our lives here, said George, whose voice sounded muffled as though he was squashed against the wall. Boys, boys, said Mr Weasley vaguely, I'm trying to think what to do. Yes, oh, only way. Stand back, Harry. Harry retreated to the sofa. Uncle Vernon, however, moved forward. Wait a moment, he bellowed at the fire. What exactly are you going to... Boof. The electric fire shot across the room at the boarded up fireplace burst outwards expelling Mr. Weasley, Fred, George and Ron in a cloud of rubble and loose chippings. Aunt Petunia shrieked and fell backwards over the coffee table. Uncle Vernon caught her before she hit the floor and gaped, speechless at the Weasleys, all of whom had bright red hair, including Fred and George, who were identical to the last freckle. Oh, that's better, panted Mr. Weasley, brushing dust from his long green robes and straightening his glasses. Ah, you, you must be uh, Harry's aunt and uncle. Tall, thin and balding, he moved towards Uncle Vernon, his hands outstretched, but Uncle Vernon backed away several paces, dragging Aunt Petunia. Words utterly failed Uncle Vernon. His best suit was covered in white dust, which had settled into his hair and moustache, and made him look as though he had just aged thirty years. Er, uh, yes, sorry about that, said Mr Weasley, lowering his hand and looking over his shoulder at the blasted fireplace. It's all my fault, it just uh, didn't occur to me that you wouldn't be able to get out of the other end. I had your fireplace connected to the flu network, you see, just uh, for an afternoon, you know, so we could get Harry. Muggle fireplaces aren't supposed to be connected, strictly speaking, but I've got useful contact at the flu regulation panel, and he fixed it for me. I can put it right in a jiffy, though, don't worry. I'll light a fire to send the boys back, and then I can repair your fireplace before I disapparate. Harry was ready to bet that the Dursleys had understood a single word of that. They were still gaping at Mr Weasley, thunderstruck. Aunt Petunia staggered upright again and hid behind Uncle Vernon. Hello, Harry, said Mr Weasley, brightly. Got your trunk ready? It's upstairs, said Harry, grinning back. Oh, get it, said Fred at once, winking at Harry. He and George left the room. They knew where Harry's bedroom was, having once rescued him from it in the dead of night. Harry suspected that Fred and George were hoping for a glimpse of Dudley. They had heard a lot about him from Harry. Well, said Mr Weasley, swinging his arms slightly, while well, we tried to find words to break the very nasty silence, very, uh, very nice place you've got here. As the usually spotless living room was now covered in dust and bits of brick, this remark didn't go down too well with the Dursleys. Uncle Vernon's face purpled once more, and Aunt Petunia started chewing her tongue again. However, they seemed too scared to actually say anything. Mr Weasley was looking around. He loved everything to do with muggles. Harry could see him itching to go and examine the television and the video recorder. They run off electric, did you, do you? He said knowledgeably. 
Ah yes, I can see the plugs. I collect plugs. He added to Uncle Vernon. And batteries. I've got a large collection of batteries. My wife thinks I'm mad, but there you are. Uncle Vernon clearly thought Mr Weasley was mad too. He moved ever so slightly to the right, screening out Petunia from view, as though he thought Mr Weasley might suddenly run at them and attack. Dudley suddenly reappeared in the room. Harry could hear the clunk of his trunk on the stairs, and knew that the sounds that had scared Dudley out of the kitchen. Dudley edged along the wall, gazing at Mr Weasley with terrified eyes, and attempted to console him behind his mother and father. Unfortunately, Uncle Vernon's bulk, while sufficient to hide bony Aunt Petunia, was nowhere near enough to conceal Dudley. Ah, this is your cousin, is it, Harry? said Mr Weasley, taking another brave stab at making conversation. Yep, said Harry, that's Dudley. He and Ron exchanged glances and then quickly looked away from each other. The temptation to burst out laughing was almost overwhelming. Dudley was still clutching his bottom as though afraid it might fall off. Mr Weasley, however, seemed genuinely concerned at Dudley's peculiar behaviour. Indeed, from the tone of his voice when he next spoke, Harry was quite sure that Mr Weasley thought Dudley was quite as mad as the Dursleys thought he was, except that Mr Weasley felt sympathy rather than fear. Having a good holiday, Dudley, he said kindly. Dudley whimpered. Harry saw his hands tighten still harder over his massive backside. Fred and George came back into the room, carrying Harry's school trunk. They glanced around as they entered and spotted Dudley. Their faces cracked into identical evil grins. All right, said Mr Weasley. Better get cracking then. He pushed up his sleeves of his robes and took out his wand. Harry saw that the Dursleys drew back against the wall as once. Incendio, said Mr Weasley, pointing his wand at the hole in the wall behind him. Flames rose at once in the fireplace, crackling merely as though they had been burning for hours. Mr Weasley took a small drawstring bag from his pocket, untied it, took a pinch of the powder inside and threw it into the flames, which turned emerald green and roared higher than ever. Off you go then, Fred, said Mr Weasley. Coming, said Fred. Oh no, hang on. A bag of sweets had spilled out of Fred's pockets and, and the contents were now rolling in every direction. Big, fat toffees in brightly coloured wrappers. Fred scrambled around, cramming them back into his pocket, and then gave Dursley a cheery wave, stepped forward and walked right into the fire, saying, The burrow! Aunt Petunia gave a little shuddering gasp. There was a whooshing sound and Fred vanished. Right then, George, said Mr Weasley, you in the trunk. Harry helped George carry the trunk forward into the flames and turn it on to its end so it could hold on better. Then, with a second whoosh, George had cried, The burrow! and vanished too. Ron, you're next, said Mr Weasley. See you, said Ron brightly to the Dursleys. He grinned broadly at Harry and then stepped into the fire, shouted the burrow, and disappeared. Now Harry and Mr Weasley alone remained. Well, bye then, said Harry to the Dursleys. They didn't say anything at all. Harry moved towards the fire, but just as he reached the edge of the hearth, Mr Weasley put out a hand and held him back. He was looking at the Dursleys in amazement. Harry said goodbye to you, he said. Didn't you hear him? Doesn't matter, Harry muttered to Mr Weasley. Honestly, I don't care. Mr Weasley did not remove his hand from Harry's shoulder. You aren't going to see your nephew till next summer, he said to Uncle Vernon in mild indignation. Surely you're going to say goodbye. Uncle Vernon's face worked furiously. The idea of being taught consideration by a man who had just blasted away half his living room seemed to be causing him intense suffering. But Mr Weasley's wand was still in his hand and Uncle Vernon's tiny eyes darted to it at once before he said very resentfully, Goodbye then. See you, said Harry, putting one foot into the green flames, which felt pleasantly like warm breath. At the moment, however, a horrible gagging sound erupted behind him and Aunt Petunia started to scream. Harry wheeled around. Dudley was no longer standing behind his parents. He was kneeling beside the coffee table and he was gagging and spluttering on a foot-long purple slimy thing that was protruding from his mouth. One bewildered second later, Harry realised that the foot-long thing was Dudley's tongue, and that a brightly coloured toffee wrapper lay on the floor before him. Aunt Petunia hurled herself onto the ground beside Dudley, seized the end of his swollen tongue and attempted to wrench it out of his mouth. Unsurprisingly, Dudley yelled and spluttered worse than ever, trying to fight her off. Uncle Vernon was bellowing and waving his arms around, and Mr Weasley had to shout to make himself heard. Not to worry, I can sort him out, he yelled, advancing on Dudley with his wand outstretched. But Aunt Petunia screamed worse than ever and threw herself on top of Dudley, shielding from Mr Weasley. No, really, said Mr Weasley, desperately. It's a simple procedure. It was a toffee, my son Fred, real practical joker, but it's only an encouragement charm. 
At least I think it is. Please, I, I can correct it. But far from being reassured, the Dursleys became more panic-stricken. Aunt Petunia was sobbing hysterically, tugging Dursley's tongue as though determined to rip it out. Dudley appeared to be suffocating under the combined pressure of his mother and his tongue, and Uncle Vernon, who had lost control completely. Seized a china figure from the top of the sideboard and threw it very hard at Mr Weasley, who ducked, causing the ornament to shatter in the blasted fireplace. Now really, said Mr Weasley angrily, brandishing his one, I'm trying to help. Bellowing like a wounded hippo, Uncle Vernon snatched up another ornament, Harry, go, just go, Mr Weasley shouted, his wand on Uncle Vernon. I'll sort it out. Harry didn't want to miss the fun, but Uncle Vernon's second ornament narrowly missed her, his left ear, and on balance he thought it best to leave the situation to Mr Weasley. He stepped into the fireplace, looking over his shoulders as he said, The burrow. His last fleeting glimpse, glimpse of the living room was of Mr Weasley blasting a third ornament out of Uncle Vernon's hand with his wand. Aunt Petunia screaming and laying on top of Dudley and Dudley's tongue lolling around like a great slimy python. But next moment, Harry had begun to spin very fast, and the Dursley's living room was whipped out of sight and a rush of emerald green flames. And there we go.